just lift your hands to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's worthy. There's no one like our God. Thank you, Jesus. God, we worship you. God, we praise you. God, we exalt you. God, we magnify you. God, your name is greater and your blood is more powerful, Jesus. God, we worship you. God, we bless and praise and exalt the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Come on, don't you have something to be thankful for, to be grateful for tonight? Will you just tell the Lord about it right now? God, in the name of Jesus, we worship your name. We praise your name, Jesus. We exalt your name, Jesus. God is truly wonderful to every single one of us. It's, it's cold. It's dreary. <laughs> some, some people are battling a- allergies. I tell you what, um, I was talking to someone this uh, just a little while ago, and there's just allergies. You can be seated. Allergies going on. And myself, I just, just drowsiness just hit me. I'm just like, oh. It is, um, this weather is, is crazy. God is good. I have heard um, just that there's, this has been a really uh, just week that has been filled with ups and downs, hills and valleys. I've heard people call me with just amazing testimonies of answered prayer, God working and doing things, and then other people facing just uh, the tragedies of life. Um, if you don't know, and this is a prayer request, I'd like, to, I'd like us just to begin with prayer, and I want to put this prayer request out before you. I encourage you, just remember uh, Sister Angie Morales, remember Ethan, Nathan, Kaylee, um, Rossman just um, suddenly and unexpectedly uh, passed on uh, Monday, and we want to ask the Lord just to keep his hand on them, minister to them um, in their time of grief, ask God to touch. There will be a memorial service, um, and it's going to be on Friday, um, and I think the... the, uh, time of the visitation, all of that is from 4 to 8, and um, I'll, I'll send out a link to the information about where that's at. It's on a funeral home. I think it's the Angelus um, on um, on Main Street there in Pasadena. Um, if you can, um, send a text, um, send something there, um, reach out. If you can stop by, I know it would be a blessing. Longtime members here of Springs of Life Church, and we want to just pray for them. That's my first prayer request tonight, that we can just remember their family, remember um, just all the way around, ask God to touch and move in that need. Anybody else got a prayer request? If you have a prayer request online, send it to us um, in the comments of the live stream or send us a message, and we'll pray with you. Anybody else have a prayer request? Pitts, Brother Pitts, just remember that need. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? I want to just reach it. Yes, sir. Okay, Jack's uncle, let's remember him. The Lord can heal cancer. The Lord can heal anything we've experienced and seen. I know I love to tell those testimonies about the things that God does. I was thinking about testimonies, and you know, we used to have old-fashioned testimony service. Uh, maybe we may just do that one Wednesday night. And we can, uh, people can think about what they'd like to um, say about what the Lord has done. But I was thinking about just the things that I've seen God do over the past little while. And some of those, uh, I talked to somebody today, and God just intervened in a situation, legal situation, that they weren't sure what was going to happen. And then God just worked it out. I, I, I remember uh, Brother Eric just being around here around the front, um, it's been some, maybe a month or so ago, and um, he just, he had had an issue in his back, and God miraculously and instantaneously healed it. I remember uh, Sister Judy just coming to church over and over again, and then struggling in her health, had some internal blood loss that they just couldn't figure out what it was, and then just one Sunday morning, just a simple prayer, not anything uh, great or grand or glorious, just a uh, d- just a simple prayer. We prayed for her, and then the next thing you know, she went back to the doctor, and things were getting better. And then she told me, she said, you know, Pastor, every time I go to the doctor, it's better and better and better and better. God does it, and when he does it, he does it right. 
Aunt Betty had some difficulties, and God just opened a door for her to see the right doctor so she can get the help that she needs. God is a prayer answering God. Amen. Sometimes one of the things that just keeps us from receiving is just because we don't ask. I like what the brother said. You know, he said, um, you know, sometimes we pray and God makes whatever decision he makes. We don't um, get to twist God's arm and make him do anything, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And the writer James says, you have not because you ask not. I wonder if there's something maybe that you want to ask the Lord to do, some type of intervention you need in your life, your relationship, your finances, your job, your health. I wish you would just uh, take a minute right now, and let's just talk to him about those things before we move forward in the service. And I want us to pray for Rosman. I want us to pray for Brother Pitts. And just um, let's talk to him right now just about whatever is in your heart right now. You'd like him to intervene. Lord, we love you right now. God, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming before you, Lord. Lord, for the privilege of talking to you, we know that you're the creator and sustainer of the universe. Lord, you're the savior. Lord God, you're the healer, the deliverer. Lord, you're the Lord of hosts. God, you have all power in heaven and in earth, Lord. God, you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. Lord, there's things that you you do, Lord. Lord God, and you do it better than we could imagine. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we lift our needs to you right now. Would you just tell him that need, that thing that's pressing on your heart? We want you to move in these needs, God. God, we want you to move and, and free and deliver, Lord God. We want you to bring about, Lord God, your will and your purpose in all of these needs. Lord, we're thankful, Lord God, for all of the healing that you have done, Lord, all the deliverance, Lord, all the testimonies of wonderful things that you've accomplished. Lord, we give you glory for those. God, we want you to touch tonight, Lord, this brother Pitts. God, we're asking you to move in his life. Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would touch that need. We want you to touch Jack's uncle, Lord. God, you see, Lord, the faith that Travis has, God, just to bring this need before you, Lord. We're asking you to heal it. God, we've seen you do it before. We've seen you heal cancer. We've seen you bring deliverance and freedom, Lord God, and liberty, God. God, we thank you for that. Lord, tonight we want you to touch Sister Angie. We want you to touch Ethan and Nathan and Kaylee, Lord. God, we want you to move in their lives. Surround them with your grace, God. Let the hand of God be upon them. Let them feel the nearness and the comfort of your spirit, God. God, for your glory. God, you see every need, God, that's here, present in this service. Lord, those that are online, we're asking you to move. We're asking you to deliver. We're asking you to bring freedom and liberty in the name of Jesus. We, If you believe God's going to answer, would you just praise him for a few moments? Come on, that's it, God, in the name of Jesus. God, we worship you. God, we praise you. God, we exalt you. God, we magnify you. God, we glorify you. God, we honor you. God, we believe that you're a prayer answering God. God, we don't ask these things, Lord God, just as a ritual, Lord, but we're specifically asking in faith, believing, God, that you are able to do more than we could ever imagine, God, in the name of Jesus Christ of now. Nazareth, we pray it, God. Would you clap your hands to the Lord and just shout to him in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. He looks, feels like you are as drowsy as I am tonight. I'm going to let our ushers come, and uh, we're going to worship the Lord in our giving. Don't forget about uh, Sunday morning uh, worship service. Thank you, brethren. You can go ahead. Um, go ahead. Sunday morning, 10 a.m., and then following the service on this Sunday, uh, we will have our uh, dinner. Uh, it's our fundraiser dinner that our ladies put on uh, once a month, and um, I think it's $8 for an adult and $5 for a child. It's a simple uh, dinner. I think it's a lasagna. lasagna dinner. You get lasagna, salad, dessert. Uh, drink all of that for either eight dollars or five dollars, and it goes towards um, everything that we are our ladies participate in. They help pay for insurances. They uh, do a multitude of of different things, and we finally back at a place where we can we feel more comfortable sitting there eating together. Praise God! <laughs> I am so glad. Um, it, it's it's a wonderful privilege just to be able to do that, and we take that for granted. Um, and for so long, we were apprehensive and nervous about that. Amen. But be mindful of all those wonderful things that are that are going on. Uh, we will have, I, I don't remember the date, um, but we're having, I think it's in 
uh, the April the 10th on a Sunday evening. We'll have a Sunday. I don't know. I don't remember what the date is. We'll have a Sunday evening service that's coming up. A missionary is going to be with us. It's March the 13th. March the 13th. Be, put that on your calendar. We'll have a, we'll have two services on March the 13th, and we will have Brother Tur here with us ministering. You won't want to miss that. And I know that the Lord will bless you. We're going to continue our sermon series um, tonight, um, talking about just the, those idols of the heart. Uh, tonight is one, and, and I, I want you to really listen because I want to really nuance this one because people can take this uh, thing to extremes. And we're going to uh, just read one verse of Scripture tonight in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter number 6, verse 25. And I just re- want to read part of that. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he said, Isn't your life more than food? See that last part. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat or more contemporary translation might say something like, isn't life more than food? Isn't life more than food and the body more than raiment? So I'm going to talk to you tonight on the, uh, we're talking about different idols. We said anything could be an idol. We're going to talk about the idol or the God of food. Amen. Uh, Eric said he didn't want to preach this one, so he had to work. <laughs> he was so speechless when I gave it to him. He was like, ouch, what are you doing? So he's probably tuned in on, we're going to talk about it tonight. Just talk about what the Bible has to say about this. But would you would you just pray that God will talk to all of us, you online, pray with us uh, tonight. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of just being in this warm building, cozy here together, Lord. God, we thank you for the privilege that we can open up your word, even when we're tired, our allergies are uh, flaring up. Lord, oh God, we can just dig into the word of the Lord. God, we're asking tonight that you would anoint us, anoint this message, this messenger in our hearts to really think about what we're going to talk about in the name of Jesus. Amen. So there was a, a certain Texas rancher. I got my boots on tonight. I got uh, Caitlin told me I had to put my... She's like, Pastor, you're not a cowboy, you're a pastor. She said, you got to put your jacket on. I said, well, rodeo starts tomorrow. And I said, yeah. So do keep all of those. We have people in our church that will be working, driving, doing different things related. And, and, and cover our city in prayer, all the things that will be happening there. But there was a, a Texas rancher. Um, he had a pair of boots made, and they turned out to be too tight. And that can be a difficult thing. And so the bootmaker insisted and said, "You know what? Why don't we just? Why don't you let me stretch them?" But the rancher, he wouldn't let him do it. He said, "No, no, 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 no." And he explained to the bootmaker his reason for wanting those boots too tight. He said, "Quote: There's little in my life that is pleasurable. Every morning, when I get out of bed." I have to go corral the cows that busted out during the night, and then I have to mend the fences that broke. And I, all day long I watch as my ranch, you know, is blowing away in the dust. And after supper, I listen to the television tell me about the high prices of feed and the low prices of beef. And, uh, he, and all while my wife is nagging me to move into town. So when I get ready for bed every night, I want to look forward to the only pleasure that I have all day long, pulling off the boots that are killing my feet because they're too tight. You know, there's very few of us would put up with a life that's devoid of any type of pleasure. And thank God, God is so good that he has given us so many wonderful, pleasurable things to enjoy in life. The scripture says that God has given us all things richly to enjoy. Just think about a place, about the place that pleasure takes in our modern lives, though. There's always been some pleasure in life between games, stories, jokes, songs. But a lot of times, and especially in our world that we live in, in our culture that we live in, I mean, it it can be to the place to where just pleasure can be just the entire goal of daily life. Now, I really want to nuance this tonight because there's nothing wrong with enjoying life. The Bible is explicit about it. The entire book of Ecclesiastes is all about, hey, you only live here a little while, you better enjoy it. 
But today we expect our daily work to be pleasurable. And you know what? There's nothing wrong. If you can enjoy what you do, you ought to. But we enjoy many things a whole lot more than many of our ancestors did. In our day and time, it if it isn't fun, a lot of times we don't want anything to do with it. Amen? In our modern culture and society, we have more leisure time and more money uh, to spend on pleasure than any time in history. Kyle Eidelman, he writes this, he says, quote, people spend trillions of dollars each year trying to make themselves happy, whether it's with food, with different forms of entertainment media, with travel, with drugs or alcohol, or with one of the countless other items that promises to turn your frown upside down. And I think living for God ought to be joyful, so don't get me wrong. So you might be thinking, what surplus time? I'm busier than I've ever been in my life. You got more time than I do, Pastor? What? So it's true, we're more busy, but what are we busy doing? Sometimes, sometimes what we find ourselves doing is busy chasing pleasure. Or you might be thinking, what pleasure? My life has been and is devoid of pleasure. I'm not enjoying this. But even if you haven't experienced very much pleasure in your life, you've probably experienced enough to know that you want more. Amen. And thus begins the quest quest for that elusive narcotic of pleasure. We started talking about counterfeit gods a couple of weeks ago defeating the idols that battle our hearts. And we've talked about idolatry, and we figured out that idolatry is a little more sophisticated than what we think it is sometimes. I am not. An, I don't even need that second commandment, we might think, because I've never made any graven image to bow anything down to anything. But we realize that uh, idols can be anything. Somebody said anything. Anything that would take the rightful place that God should have in our lives. And last week we talked about the fact that God is a jealous God, not jealous of us, but jealous for us. We said that being jealous in God's part is a good expression of his love for us and his protection of our well-being. Today, tonight, we're going to talk about and we're going to just begin to talk about just specific things that can be a God in our lives that will battle for our hearts. Kyle Eidelman, in his book, Gods at War, going to kind of use it as a, as a template for what we're going to talk about. But he talks about counterfeit gods under three different headings. He talks about uh, worshiping at the temple of pleasure, number one, worshiping at the temple of power, or worshiping at the temple of love. Three different places where we can worship different idols. In the temple of pleasure, we're going to talk about a couple of different gods. There are things there like uh, things that can be gods, and none of these things in and of themselves are bad. They're actually gifts from God, but in the temple of pleasure there are the gods of food, the god of sex, the god of entertainment, and there are gods in the temple of pleasure for sure, but these are the ones that we most often find ourselves bowing down to. I want to just make something really, really clear. And, and, and as I read these notes and as I studied this afternoon and just thinking about it, I said, i got to really nuance this because there's some people that uh, they're extremists, right? And you preach a sermon about the God of food and then they decide, you know what? All I'm doing each day is I'm eating one tiny bowl of rice because I'm not going to let food be my God. I'm like, no, you got it wrong. That's not how. That's not what I said. Right? I'm never eating any more of those chocolate bars that the ladies gave out last night at their ladies' meeting. I heard that all the chocolate, all the white chocolate bars that I sent with my wife got taken. So I want to say this, and I, I mean, hear me before I say anything else that I'm that that I'm going to say tonight. That uh, this is vital and it's important for this entire series especially for all you extremists. There's some black and white, all or nothing people here that will just say, food can be a God I'm never eating again. No. All the, th- all the things that can become counterfeit gods, including food, sex, entertainment, they're not sinful. They're not evil in and of themselves. God's given them all to us. 
Bible says that God has given us all things richly to enjoy. In fact, all of these things can have the potential to be good gifts from God that draw our hearts to God all the more. Every one of those things. Every one of the things that we're going to talk about being an idol can also, on the flip side, every one of them has a dark and a light side. It depends on how we're using them, where we're placing them in our lives. They can be turned into counterfeit gods when we mishandle them. So as we move forward from this, the general topic of idolatry into specific counterfeit gods, like the one we're going to discuss tonight, the God of food, we move from the abstract to the concrete, and the old saying goes, we move from preaching to meddling. So one of the things you might be interested to know and, and think about, how, anybody ever seen the movie Over the Hedge? Some people are shaking their heads. So it's an innocent animated comedy, and it provides a good illustration and starting point for what we're going to talk about, the God of food. The movie is about a group of animals that move from the woods to the suburbs. Some people are shaking their head. Yeah, I know that one. There's RJ. He's the raccoon. And this raccoon has made a discovery. He says, you know what, human beings who live in the suburbs, they're bottomless pits of food. RJ, he gets the animals together and he explains to them, we eat to live, but humans live to eat. RJ tells his animal friends that if they will just hang around the hedges, then there will always be something to eat. He offers to show the other animals what he's talking about so that they will follow him to peek in on this human family. And RJ explains to them that the human mouth is called a pie hole. And he says, in fact, people themselves are called couch potatoes. He explains that telephones are actually, you see that thing? That's a device for summoning food. As they watch someone get on the phone, and sure enough, the next thing you know, pizza arrives at their house. RJ continues to explain. He says, Human be, humans bring the food, take the food, ship the food, and drive the food. He points to passing trucks with pictures of food on them. It seems that everything people do involves food. And as the people pray for dinner at the table, RJ says, you see, they're worshiping at the altar of food. Then he points to the treadmill. And he says, that gets rid of the guilt so that they can eat more. Praise God. Obviously, there's some tongue-in-cheek humor here, but... It's not that far off base when we just really think about the role that food plays in our life. And food's a gift from God. When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, the Bible says that he gave them the food from all of the trees to eat. After Noah and his family came out of the garden, uh, came out of the, the ark, he said, you know, you can eat all these beasts. Just eat whatever you want. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. God he made food something that's good, and it's a gift from him. But when we think about the role that food plays in our life, statistics, these are a, a, little, a little old, but in 2015 showed that Americans spent about $208 billion on fast food a year. I say, wow. $208 billion. Thank you, Brother Greg. In 2015, Americans spent $7.5 billion, and I thought about this today, Sister Janine, when we were having our little lunch, and she brought in, I had some of that leftover chicken from the ladies' meeting last night, and she brought in this bag of potato chips. But do you know that in 2015, and she said, you want to try some of these kettle chips? Americans spent $7.5 billion on potato chips, and according to the USDA, Potato chips are the most eaten form of potato in American homes. Let's hear it for potato chips. According to the American Center for Disease Control, and this is not a joke, this is not, it's, it's very serious, and all of us may battle these things at different times in our lives, but 68% of Americans are overweight and one-third of Americans are obese. The average American consumes two to three pounds of sugar per week. 
Whereas 100 years ago, when heart disease and cancer were not nearly so common, the average person consumed only five pounds of sugar per year. It's hard to argue that perhaps for some, this wonderful gift from God that is meant to be enjoyed can become this idol, this God of food in our own nation. And, but in all fairness, the God of food is an equal opportunity God. It's not just those who struggle perhaps with eating too much or, or, or wrestling with those things, but a person can have a strong metabolism and, and, and look very fit, and yet food can still be a God to them. Food can also be a God when we consume when when we are consumed with diet and exercise and those are good things praise god somebody just hooked me up where i go with my wife they they said here you go I'll, I'll i'll help you out so you can have that membership at the gym i i'm all about the gym praise god our bodies are the temple of the holy ghost and we ought to but a person can build their life around organic health foods and they might still be building their life around the counterfeit God. You see, it doesn't go just one way. Sometimes we can make these judgments about people, but it's not about that thing, but it's about what our focus is. And if our focus and our energy is just on that all the time, nevertheless, it's a God that can demand an incredible sacrifice of time and money and a God that specializes sometimes in vanity and pride. And as that God encourages us to worship our own image and to take credit for our good health, let me emphasize again the fact that food is not bad in and of itself. Amen. Food is good. Amen. I'm hungry right now. In the Bible... The vast majority of the time, food is treated as a gift from God. You just go, it, it, it says it over and over again. God's given you food. He's given you food. He's, he's given this thing to you. God made it good. God could easily have made the fueling process of the body cut and dry, right, like putting gas in your tank. He could just made this bland substance that you eat, but God didn't do that. God gave us just all of these different colors and textures and tastes and, I mean, and all of those taste buds, 10,000 taste buds. I mean, he's given us a high-definition tasting. God wants us to enjoy food. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so eating is meant to be a blessing. Amen. It's meant to be something that we enjoy and we enjoy to the fullest. We ought to enjoy. But the problem is that every gift God gives us can be twisted into a lure that can pull us away from him as well. Let's think for a minute about the way the God of food works. Let's imagine walking into one of the food God's favorite temples, the Cheesecake Factory. Like all good restaurants, there's nothing inherently wrong with the restaurant, but let's just use it as an example of how, you know, sometimes it's designed, I mean, it's praise God, it's designed to make money. Money's not a bad thing. But we enter there, it's meant to appeal to everything that, that we, we want. The restaurant is not designed just for bodily sustenance or nutrition, but it's all about satisfaction. And guess what? There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But the menu and its offerings are all about throwing a big party for our taste buds. Praise God. And in a few minutes that we dine there, all that is right in the world, it's just a piece of heaven. And I believe that's a gift from God for us to enjoy and say, wow, I enjoyed that. That was good. Have you ever noticed that we apply heaven or spirituality to the uh, pleasure of eating? That cake is just heavenly. This pie is to die for. If you've never had Aunt Betty's pie before, that's their temple. The coconut cream pie. Whew. We call things comfort food. And even with that, you know, God does. And sometimes it is good to say, man, I just, I need a hot white chocolate mocha from Starbucks. And, oh, man, I just feel better. And that's a good thing. Everybody's getting hungry. Like, you preached about it. Now we're all going to go gorge. Somebody said they eat that thing and they said, Man, I thought I just died and gone to heaven. Or this is the nectar of the gods. Like I said before, 
There's nothing wrong with eating. There's nothing wrong with enjoying any of these things, any, any of these restaurants that have so, so many good things to offer and so many things that are delicious. If you want a really good cheesecake, you can go right next door to Antonio's. She makes those things. And it's not idolatry to enjoy it richly. The problem begins, though, when we start to look for to food to do for us what God alone should do. Now, here's the real nitty-gritty. Instead of turning to God, how often do we try to treat our troubled life or our troubled soul as if it were a growling stumble, stomach? Eidelman wrote this. He said, when the going gets tough, the tough get chewing. Frank Farrell said this, a very large part of mankind's ills and of the world's misery is due to a rampant practice of trying to feed the soul with the body's food. Let's think about some of the ways that we give ourselves over to the God of food to bring meaning into our lives. Okay, here we go. First of all, some people look to the God of food to give themselves a a feeling of control. If I control this aspect of how I eat, then you know what? I, I, I feel like I'm in control of my life. Succumbing to the desire to overeat may be a way that some people demonstrate power and control. Our lives can be so complicated and they're often filled with unmet desires and disappointments and although we can't control others and make them do what we want them to do, we learn that we can, uh, we can exert control over food. We're going to show that chocolate bi- pie who is boss. And interesting enough, the opposite problem There are people that face, and all of these things are very real, and they're not, I mean, they're not ultimately, there's a place where they're not humorous. And some of us, if we've ever wrestled with those things about eating and eating too much or trying or or not eating enough, because the flip side is true, people that experience things like anorexia or bulimia, they can have the same root desire, guess what, to demonstrate power and control. Well, this is something I can't control about my life. That person may starve themselves, himself or herself, as a way of trying to prove I'm in control. Second, some people look to the God of food to give themselves an escape or distraction from reality. A constant stream of pleasant eating sensations can cover up our troubles and can keep more troubling self-examination at bay. I I, I know people that have wrestled with it. As a pastor and as serving, where it's just like uh, people have told me, you know, I just feel like I just eat myself into oblivion and I, I, I'm just escaping. A box of chocolates is more pleasant than self assessment and self improvement. Somebody said, Amen. And we laugh, but it's true. One minister says this when people ask me why God seems distant sometimes, I ask them, How much junk food have you been eating and how much TV have you been watching? Somebody say, Oh, me. I told you I'm meddling, right? They're like, Man, I love this idol series. Food can be a great escape and balm for what hurts. You know, it can be. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everything in moderation, right? But it's when that place comes to where that's what is controlling and driving my life that it becomes something that perhaps it's bordering on or has become an idol in my life. Third, some people look to the God of food to give them insulation or an outer protection from harm. For some people, compulsive eating is linked to a desire to get... Uh, you know, I want to I wanna bulk up. I want to just, you know, I want to, I, I, I'm scared of being too thin or too small. Or perhaps because of abuse they've experienced in their lives, they may equate becoming uh, just, if, if I'm, I'm too small or I, 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 I have this particular figure or, or this area in my life, I may seem sexually attracted to someone and I'm going to avoid that at all costs. I'm going to feed myself because I, I'm, I'm not interested. For others, because of the abuse they've experienced, there's a place where if I can bulk up, eat more, I'm bigger than, it feels like a place of safety or 
or power for protection. All of us need that sense that life is not out of control, amen? And we need comfort from our fears and pains, and we need a sense of protection and safety. But the question is this, where will we look for those needs to be filled? Will I look for it maybe in the God of food, and I'm, praise God, I hope everybody, I won't keep eating, keep enjoying food. Amen? It's a gift from God. But will we look to it, something is just hitting home with you, and you ask yourself, uh, hey, is that, am I allowing that to, is that out of control in my life? Will we look to that God? I want you to look at the Gospel of John, Gospel of John chapter number 6. We're just going to think here about this text for a moment. Consider this moment in Jesus' ministry, and this will be something that perhaps you haven't thought about before. We see how food became Jesus' competition. We're familiar with this story. Jesus feeds 5,000, 5,000 men, not counting women and children and all those that were there that day. He just, this massive crowd who were numbered 5,000 men and all of the women and children that were present, it had been a long day, and they were all far from home, and they needed to be fed. And Jesus, in his compassion, right, I'm going to tell you, so food is a gift from God. So all of you people that say, I see there, Pastor preached, and now I only eat one bowl of rice a day and no desserts. All of that's evil. All of you other people are carnal because you eat. Whatever. Jesus says, he's like, oh, man, we can't send these guys away. They're hungry. I'm going to fix them something good to eat. Here we go. I want to make sure they have something to eat. The bread was the staple of the diet. The, the, the fish were just like little sardines. They were just basically a condiment, you know, like the ketchup, just to give the bread a little taste. And Jesus said, you know what, I'm going to make ketchup and French fries for everybody. I'm not just going to give them the fries. I could have just given them bread. So I'm going to multiply the fish too. I'm going to give them something to dip it in. Hey, Jesus wants to provide for our sustenance, and he is happy about it tasting good. Somebody say, praise God. He said they needed to be fed, and so Jesus miraculously feeds them with just five barley loaves and a couple of fish, and yet everyone is filled. Somebody say filled. Some people are like, well, I never eat until I'm full because I'm more spiritual than you are. Whatever. They ate until they were full. They enjoyed the good gift that Jesus gave them that day. He miraculously gave it to them. And Jesus used that opportunity as an object lesson. He wanted them to see the need to satisfy their souls was more than the need to satisfy their bodies. Jesus wanted to help the people learn to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Remember what he said in our text for tonight was Matthew 6 and 25. We're on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't you realize that your life is more than food? Jesus quotes from, the Deuteron from Deuteronomy when he was in the wilderness and the devil was tempting him. You know, man shall not live by bread alone, but man will live by bread. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So after everyone had eaten their fill in John chapter number 6, Jesus dismisses them and he makes his way to the other side of the lake. When the crowds follow Jesus, they wake up in the next morning and yesterday's feast is digested. It's gone and they're hungry again. They start looking for Jesus and they're thinking, surely he's going to be open for breakfast. Gave us french fries and ketchup yesterday, maybe hash browns. And When they find Jesus on the other side of the lake, John 6, 26 through 27, here's what Jesus had to say to them. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, not because you saw my miracles, not because you're looking for these things, but because you ate 
your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus told them that all they had to do was believe in him. It's kind of laughable when you read here because their reply to Jesus, they suggest that Jesus give them a sign so that they will believe. Here he is, he already fed them with five, fed them with five loaves and two fishes, and he's done all of these wonderful things. And just in case Jesus couldn't think up a good sign, they suggest one, and they say, you know what would be nice? Some of that fresh bread from heaven like Moses gave to the children of Israel. They quote the scripture to him. The crowd had bread on the brain. That's what was dominating. That's what their thinking was all about. When food becomes an idol, it's at that place to where that's all that we can think about. And we're, we're, we're so affluent. It's all we can think about just because sometimes, uh, and not everybody, I mean, I, I don't know, I may not be preaching to anybody. This might, this might not apply to anyone here tonight. But we're, we have so abundantly much. We've never, we've been hungry. Some of you and some, you, you may have faced starvation, but I don't think any of us, and maybe I, I may be wrong, but I don't think any of us have experienced, like I, I listened to one young lady uh, from, who escaped from North Korea, and she, she talked about the thing that just propelled her to leave, and it wasn't political it wasn't anything in her mind. She said the reason that she left is because all there was to eat was some old rotten potatoes. And when they were already eaten all the rotten potatoes, there wasn't anything else to eat, and it was over. And she had heard that even the dogs in just across the border in China eat rice. And she said, you know what? It's worth a try because I'm hungry. I'm really hungry. Jesus explained to those in John chapter number 6, he said in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. With those words, Jesus explains to the crowd that though they haven't realized it, he's the real bread that they need. Sometimes we're trying to fill that void, whatever it is, and it goes both ways. It goes, I'm, I'm eating too much, I'm not eating enough, I'm, I'm, I, I'm too much comfort food, I, I'm just finding, all my, I'm, I'm eating myself into oblivion, or I'm starving myself, but it's all related to that God of food, all of you starvers too, okay. But Jesus said, that's not, that's not what you got to be looking for. I've got to be central to your life. Then the thing that you need to eat, the thing that you need to consume, you need to take my life into you. And that's the place where you'll try find true fulfillment. That's the place where you'll find true comfort. That's the place where you'll find true control over yourself because the fruit of the Spirit is temperance. They had come wanting some bread for their stomachs, but Jesus was there saying, you know what, I've got some bread for your souls. Yeah, I'll provide for your belly, but I'm going to give you so much more than that. The question that one, uh, one of us needs to wrestle with and answer is this, do I really believe that Jesus is the bread of life and that my real hunger and thirst can only be satisfied by Have we learned to experience Jesus' promise, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Have we taken the psalmist challenge from Psalms 30, 34 and 8, where he said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Have we understood what Jesus said when Satan tried to tempt him, when he said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Sometimes we think that that's just talking about, uh, I, I live by just my daily devotion, reading scripture, but that's not all that it means. What it means is every decree, what heaven has decreed for me, that's the way that I live. Every decree that heaven has said, uh, the reason I'm alive right now is because heaven has decreed it. The reason I'm still making and I still have the victory is because heaven has decreed it. It's not the bread that I eat and the things that I do on my own. Yes, meditating in the word brings me into alignment with that. Have we come to have the mindset of Jesus when he said, 
in John chapter 4, verse 32 and verse 34, I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Has the God of food taken our attention away from our real God who is the bread of life? So here's, I'm going to ask you some questions again this week, okay? Questions for reflection in closing. Question number one, do I eat more for pleasure or for nourishment? Now, like I said, there's nothing wrong with eating for pleasure. But why do I eat what I eat? Is it because I am trying to just uh, bury myself in this pleasure or am I eating for nourishment and enjoying it? Again, let me repeat, there's nothing wrong with finding pleasure from a gift that God is giving us. But when we pursue pleasure for its own sake and it's our only pursuit in life, it has a way of expanding beyond its borders and eventually just taking over. Question number two, when and why do I overindulge? Does the word comfort food really describe my reason for eating all the time? Do I use food as a salve for my daily hurts? And when things in my life are going wrong, is my first impulse to reach for food? Or do I use food as a reward after a long day of work? And sometimes this is a good thing, but it can be a bad thing. Somebody say, I deserve a Big Mac on the way home. Or at the end of the day, a big bowl of ice cream. I love pistachio almond. I got a big old giant one. The other day I did it myself. It was just comfort food. I had so much going on. I was doing schoolwork and being bombarded by everything. I said, you know what? Right now I'm having some pistachio almond. That's a good thing, but... Am I doing it in excess? Am I, is it beyond its borders where that's all the comfort I find in my life? Or am I seeking to the bread of heaven and saying, hey, Lord, this pistachio almond's not doing it for me. I need some of that bread that you can give. I need you to fill my heart and my mind and my spirit, God. If my relationship is going to get right, if my job situation, if, if everything is going to get right, Lord, it's going to be because I'm consuming what you are giving. Question number three, am I able, am I able to o- exercise Holy Spirit-given self-control? The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is temperance, right? Can I enjoy a slice of pizza or do I have to consume the whole pie? Can I enjoy a piece of chocolate or does it have to be the whole box or bag? One of the easiest ways to gauge the power of the God of food has over you is to go on a fast, right? Now let me talk to all you extremists again, okay? There's some people you don't need to be fasting. If you're diabetic or you're faith, just quit it. Go on a media fast. Do something else. Some health problems, it, we have to be very careful about fasting, but h- how hard would it be for us to fast a meal? Can we just set that aside and say, you know what, food, you're not my God. I used to do this practice, and this can be an extreme, okay? I used to be an extremist, okay? I can, boy, I, I have the tendency to be one, believe me. But one of my practices, <laughs> some people are like, yeah, you do. <laughs> one of the practices that I used to do, and I, I don't even remember who, who I learned it from, was just tell myself no about something every day. Tell my appetites, no, you're not the boss. No. Because I can eat them hot Cheetos every day. I don't know what happened to me. After I got COVID and after staying in the house, I just started eating hot Cheetos. I won't digress. But maybe that practice of fasting, that might be something that we want to add back into our life every now and then. Just say, you know, Lord, at lunchtime here, I got a little alone time. Nobody else is. I'm just going to shove the plate away and I'm going to. Eat the bread of heaven. God, I want to I draw near to you. I want to make sure that my body knows, that my mind and heart knows that my stomach is not my God. You are. I want to end with the point that Kyle Eidelman makes in his devotional thought. Jesus, my portion. He writes this. Idols are defeated not by being removed but by being replaced. He continued, the God of food promised us to feast, 
but we came up empty. He invited us to consume it uh, until it consumed our lives. We tasted everything until nothing had taste anymore. And so finally we come to Jesus. We discover that he offers the one true feast. He fills our every need. Every hunger ultimately leads back to him. David wrote it like this. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Jesus frees us from an abusive, dysfunctional relationship with food because he is our portion, and in him we discover what we are searching for all along. If we seek our joy and meaning in food, then the source of our joy always disappears, and it always has to be found again. It's a consumable God, but it's different with Jesus. Nothing tastes better than the joy and satisfaction of knowing Jesus. Nothing nourishes our soul. Oh, would you just bow your heads for a moment? Nothing nourishes our soul as Jesus does. Nothing feeds and strengthens and renews us like the time we spend with him each day. For some of us, we wouldn't miss a meal, but how often have we missed a time of prayer? For some of us, we wouldn't miss that place, but how often have we missed that daily devotion of just spending time in His presence? He bids us to take and eat. He bids us to come to the well, and He offers us living water so that we may never thirst again. I want you to think about this with your eyes closed prayerfully. Think about a time that you came in from the hot sun. And you're drenched with sweat and your throat is parched and your lips may be cracked. And you walk in there and you just downed a cool glass of ice water. Did anything ever taste better than that? That's the kind of moment, this moment is more than a vague hint of what it feels like to be spiritual, starving, and to be given the bread of life, and that to have a thirsty soul, and to drink deep of that living water. One of the things that is ironic as I close, it is only when we find our meaning in Jesus When he takes the throne of our lives, that guess what happens? The earthly gift of food, it gets back its delight. It's amazing what happens when we set Jesus on the throne. When food and every other pleasure, every other thing we can make an idol is in its place. And Jesus is on the throne. All of those things are so much more enjoyable. Would you pray with me in closing, Jesus? Lord, we love you. We come before your presence right now knowing that you're the one that truly satisfies. You're the one that gives us the sustenance of life that we truly, truly, truly need. And really, Lord, whether we realize it or not, it's what we truly desire, Lord. God, we come before your presence right now and we ask you to help us. Help us to dethrone those idols from our lives, Lord. And if this Uh, sermon tonight resonated with us, God. Help us to practice, oh God, and to put into practice the things that will help us to grow in our relationship with you. And we'll thank you for it, Lord. Forgive us for all the idols in our lives. Deliver us and free us in your gentleness, God. And we'll thank you for it. Could you all stand and just lift your hands to the Lord in, 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 in closing and just Tell him thank you. If he's talked to you tonight, tell him thank you. If he's spoken to you and reminded you of anything tonight, would you just tell him thank you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. I worship you. I praise you. I exalt you. I magnify you. God, I love you tonight, and I I bless you. You're so wonderful. You're so great. You're so mighty. There's no one like you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord bless you and keep you. I hope to see you Sunday. Be mindful of the moraleses. If you can make it by uh, the funeral home on this Friday, please do. And, um, and I know that the Lord will bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.
We're so glad you joined us for worship today. I pray the service was a blessing to you and that you'll join us again next week. If you would, take some time to like us on social and share, share this video. You can connect with us via our website at springsoflifechurch.org, springsoflifechurch.org. There, you can send me an email, submit a prayer request, learn more about Springs of Life Church, learn more about being baptized, or what your next step might be on your spiritual journey. Thanks for hanging out with us, and we hope to see you next week. I'm praying for you. Bless you in Jesus' name.